It's always a privilege to be here for a lot of reasons. And I could give you a lot of spiritual reasons, but uh, I'm glad to be here with my daughter and her husband, Chris. God bless you. We just spent some time in their home and enjoyed it so much. It was such a blessing to us. And uh, my, she don't want me to start telling funny things. So I, I think, I think I'll forego that. After all, this is anniversary time, and uh, this is a special time for her. So I, I won't tell you all the funny things I know. Believe me, I got 37, 38 years of funny things stored up. But uh, I love Pastor Kim. She is a blessing to us and uh, and to the kingdom of God. I thought a lot about what I was going to talk about and thought I had it figured out last night while we were eating. Talking to Chris, sitting across from him, and I felt like the Lord was starting pouring things into me. A truth that I just want to share with you, and I think you'll recognize it to be true. And so feeling terrible because I'm trying to, and I'm not a guy that can handle that iPhone like some of y'all. I mean, Pastor Kim, it looks like it's magic. She just, she can text anything so quick, hunting and pecking. And so I was trying to write down some ideas that I felt like God was speaking to me last night. So uh, I'm going to share them with you today. And I'll just go ahead and tell you I've lost my preaching voice. Uh, so I probably won't hang from a chandelier and probably wouldn't work here anyway. But uh, if you've got a voice or if you've got an ear to hear, we'll get through this just fine today. Because hearing is what it's all about anyway. Uh, God has chosen through the foolishness of preaching and our hearing it and believe in it to save those that are lost. So, uh, God bless you, Pastor Kim, and congratulations on this third anniversary. Who, who would have ever thunk it? And here we are. I'm going to talk to you today, and it's going to, my subject's going to be strange for an anniversary service. You know, that's always the most uplifting and and this might be too, but my subject is strange. I want to talk to you about suffering. Suffering. Now, this don't fit into modern theology today. But suffering is an important part of God's work. Not that he in, inflicts us with suffering, but life does it by itself. You cannot get through life without suffering. I don't care who you are and how much money you have, if you live in a mansion or if you live in a shotgun house, everybody suffers. And so suffering is a, it's inevitable. You can't get away from it. But the thing that does make a difference, just be settled in it, you're going to suffer, but how you come out of it makes all the difference in the world. So I'm going to talk to you about suffering, the rite of passage. The rite of passage. Let me give you a definition that I looked up this morning. A rite of passage is a ritual of the passage which occurs when an individual leaves one group to enter another. That transi transition produces a significant change of status in that person's life. It's a transition when you leave one group and get to another group. So 
as strange as my subject is, we're going to talk about so. I said it already. Let me say it again. I'll probably say it twice more before I'm through. But it's part of life, suffering. You're going to cry some. Thank God we don't have to cry always, but you will cry some. And you will go through things that you don't know the reason for. You're going to go through things that you wonder about. And in case you haven't yet, you will finally go through something that will cause you to even question God. Anybody in here ever question God? Well, don't feel bad. You're in good company because Jesus did. He questioned God. Why have you forsaken me? Let this cup pass from me. Where are you at? Jesus suffered. And so it's part of the kingdom of God. And if we, the Bible said, if we suffer with him, we will also, what? Reign with him. And so suffering is part of growing to the place that you finally reign with him. Now, there are a whole lot of people that want to get in the kingdom of God and they want to get through it without any problems and they want to rule and reign. But it just don't work that way. You've got to go through something first. Jesus, who was God in human flesh, suffered. He had to suffer. If you read through the book of Psalms and other scriptures, it tells us that he suffered and that he went through horrible suffering. Did Jesus have to suffer? Did he have to suffer? The answer is, yes, he had to suffer because he came to this world, but he was not yet equipped. Let me read a scripture to you, and I've watched theologians struggle with this one for really all my life. Hebrews 5, 5 through 9. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. He didn't become the high priest by glorifying himself. But it was he who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now watch this. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, and vehement cry and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son. Listen. Yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. As I said, I've heard a lot of theologians struggle with that. But as an old man now, having watched for a lot of years and studied for a long time, I think I have it figured out. Jesus came into this world without sin. And by the way, when he left at the ascension, he left without sin. He went through everything that he went through without sin, and then... What is this talking about him being perfected? How is Jesus, the God of glory, being perfected? What do you do for him? Well, God had a plan for him. And God's plans don't always suit everybody. In fact, God's plans seldom suit us. But God had a plan for him, and he was going to become the great high priest that ministered to all God's people with compassion and understanding. And he'd hear their crying, and he would be able to weep with them. 
when they were hurting, he'd be able to hurt with him. The only problem was Jesus had never suffered. He was God. God don't have headaches. God don't get sick. God don't have pain. But he sent his son who would become the great high priest who was going to be able to identify with you and me in our own suffering. So how is he going to be perfected? You'll never be able to understand what they're going through until you went through it. Until you have suffered the pain that they have feeling, you'll never be able to identify or be compassionate toward them. And so it was in God's plan for him to suffer. And through his suffering, he learned to submit to it and not become bitter, not become upset, not to curse God, but he learned. He learned to be obedient to the suffering that he went through. And as a, as a result, he became my great high priest. And aren't you glad you have a great high priest? That means when you're hurting, you can have confidence to go to him. Let me read some scripture to you real quick. Hebrews chapter 4, 15 through 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Man, I could just stop and preach on that by itself. We do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weakness. Anybody have weaknesses? Anybody suffer through things? Anybody got a lot of sickness in your body or things happening in your family or trouble going on somewhere? Jesus understands and he sympathizes. He sympathizes with us. Let me continue reading. But was in all points tempted just as we are, yet without sin. That means he was tempted to do everything wrong just like you are. He was tempted to commit fornication. He was tempted to blaspheme. So, oh, the devil said, bow down and worship me. And so that was a fault. That was a temptation, but he endured that temptation. And so when you're going through it, and you don't understand, and you don't know where God is, we have a high priest. Thank God that learned that suffering would qualify him. Suffering qualified him to be who he was. And aren't you glad the Bible said he is seated today at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us because he sympathizes and understands. He's saying, I've been there. I know what you're going through. I have felt that. You're suffering loss. I felt loss. You suffered rejection. I have also suffered rejection. And so, thank God. We have that kind of high priest. So he said, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So once again, he understands what you're going through. When your kids are going haywire, he understands. You, y'all understand haywire? I was raised in the country in Louisiana and, uh, so I have a lot of, I have, I'll try to stay in front of this thing. That's hard for me to do. <laughs> yeah. But I know what haywire is. That's when things are not going right. That's when things are broken. God understands. He empathizes with us. Let me read another scripture to you. Hebrews chapter 4, 15 to 16. I'm reading it out of the Amplified. This is the same scripture. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize and understand our weaknesses and temptations, 
but one who has been tempted, knowing exactly how it feels to be human in every respect as we are. You're a good woman. Thank you. Thank you. She could read me. Therefore, let us with privilege approach the th approach the throne of grace, that is, the throne of God's gracious favor, and with confidence and without fear, so that we may receive mercy for our failures and find his amazing grace to help us in time of need, an appropriate blessing coming at the right moment. Thank God for that. He was made perfect by the things that he suffered. He became our high priest through that. Let me just tell you and see if we can't get to the heart of this today. When you're going through it, our enemy always tempts and he, his ultimate goal is to get you to curse God when you're going through tough times. And a whole lot of people do and sadly a whole lot of Christians do. Finding fault with God, why did it happen to me? But if you can understand that your temptations and your problems and all the things that you're going through, it's really the making of you if you will keep the right attitude and the right spirit through it. Learn from your suffering rather than getting bitter. Don't curse your crisis, but learn from it. Learn to pray through over it. Learn to worship through it. Because in doing that, you'll come out strong in God's purpose working out in your life. Amen? 1 Peter chapter 5, 9-10 through 10 says this, But resist him, talking about the devil, be firm in your faith against his attack, rooted, established, immovable, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. You do not suffer alone. After you have suffered for a while, listen to this. After, everybody say after. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts His blessings and favor, who called you to His own eternal glory in Christ, will Himself complete, confirm, strengthen, and establish you, making you what you ought to be. That's God's promise. And boy how powerful is that. And so suffering is a rite of passage. I, I have in my notes here. I was going to talk to you about David. David's suffering and the things that he went to. But nobody becomes a king without first suffering. Nobody becomes a great leader without going through it. Amen. You, you have to have a history. Now listen. You can become a preacher Never having suffered, but you can't become a pastor. You can go through a whole lot of things as an evangelist. Never have to worry about anything. You're just doing great, but until you suffered, you can't pastor. Because a pastor, like the high priest, has to suffer a while. Because you will never be able to identify with the people that you're preaching to and you're working with and that you're pastor. I remember a young preacher many years ago went to a woman whose husband had died. And she, he just fell on her and said, I'm so sorry. I know how you feel. And she said, have you lost somebody? Well, no. And immediately, she wasn't able to latch on to what he was saying because he didn't know what it was about. But when somebody knows what it's like to cry all night, when somebody knows what it's like to cry all week, when somebody knows what suffering is really about, they learn how to pray, not in seminary, but in the furnace of affliction. Oh, thank God. I'm going to tell you, thank God for people that have been through it. And if you know how to pray, if you learn how to pray, 
Ooh, it feels good when they pray for you because you know they know how. Amen. And so I don't need to tell you that you have a pastor. I think I'm here today to tell you that you're well qualified. Well qualified. Because I've known you a long, long time. I know the times that you cried when nobody knew you cried. I'm aware of the times that you went through it when nobody in the world knew you were going through it, except close family. Kim was always, pardon me, I call her, don't you? But she was always, she was raised in church. Always loved God. When I first met her, my, I was so impressed, this young lady. She was a worship leader. Matter of fact, she was a worship leader at this church for a long time. But she was a worship leader. And I watched her worship through her pain. I watched her worship through her trouble. Nobody in the house, and that's the way leaders are. Nobody else knows what's going on. But she kept God first in her life, going through a lot of terrible things. And she always, it seemed, you remember the Hebrew children? The Bible said that they went through the fiery furnace and they come out without the smell of smoke. I watched her when she was in the furnace, but she always came forth like she had never been through. Worshiping God and praising God because she is a worshiper. Amen? And then I remember, I want to get away from that because I can get too personal, but I remember when Seth was injured. Horrible accident. I love you, buddy. I've told you about my story when I heard. But let me tell you their story. Let me tell you about Kim. I received a phone call and I couldn't understand nothing that was being said because she was screaming. She was in so much pain and so much shock that I would say, you've got to get a hold of yourself and tell me what's happened. Because she was hurting. Her baby had been critically injured. Y'all know that story. But let me tell you the rest of it. We were with her at the hospital. And I never one time saw Kim break down in front of her son. She didn't do that. I heard her say, I go in the bathroom and fall apart and I pray and then I come out. She was always talking positive, always saying, he's going to live, he's not going to die. The doctor said it's hopeless and she said, bless God, is not hopeless. And so she prayed and believed God and spoke healing over him. Not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, but for months. Months. I never saw her lose it. She was always strong for her son. And I want to tell you what. She learned something through that. She learned that persistence, holding on to God, does make a difference. When things are really bad if you just hold on keep confessing keep believing it God does show up and I'm so glad that that fella is sitting over there now if we could just get him to eat a few things that'd be good but Kim was strong if I had a baby in the hospital I'd feel good if she came and prayed for me. But 
because I know she knows what it feels like. She knows the pain. And so I want to just tell you, you're blessed to have a pastor that's been through the fire of affliction, that knows what it's like, that knows that prayer works. And then, of all things, her marriage failed. Through no fault of her own, her marriage failed. She was so devastated, and I understand, I think I understand what that would be like, but I've never had that happen. But I saw her, and I empathized. I, I saw the pain. I heard her. What do you do when you're a first lady, and all of a sudden you're left? Left with a group of people that you love and a vision that you love, and Nobody with you. And so Kim would call me. And I remember she would call me and say, I love those people, but I, I can't, I can't pastor them. And I said, why not? She said, I'm a woman. I said, so what? Miriam was a woman. Phoebe was a woman. Come on, the Bible's full of women that were great leaders. Deborah was a woman. And in the Pentecostal movement many years ago, if it hadn't been for godly women that took the bull by the horn and preached the gospel, the gospel probably wouldn't have been spread. So thank God for women that can carry the load. Amen. But she told me, she said, I'm a woman. And I fussed with her about that. And then she said, I, I'm not equipped. You know, I, I don't know anything about that. All I know, and, and I remember she said to me, I don't know what I'm going to do because I don't have anybody, no way of support, no way to get help, and I don't know how to do anything. All I know anything about is church and worship and praise. And that's all I know. And I said, maybe that's all you need to know. Maybe that's all you need to know. And so Kim, pardon me, keep calling her Kim. She wrestled with her own qualifications. What are people going to think, she said. And I said, who cares what anybody thinks? Yeah, I mean, what difference does it make what people think? She said, some people will be offended. I said, let them be offended. You can't make everybody happy. You can't live your life for everybody else. You have to walk this thing out with Christ in yourself. Amen. And answer to nobody. but God. And then I remember when she called me. And she said, well, I don't know how to even talk to you about this. But a nice guy asked me if I'd go out and drink coffee with him. Should I go drink coffee with him? Why not? Why not? Well, that progressed in a little while. It was, what will the church think? He wants to get married. And I said, that's a good thing. He's not wanting to shack up. He wants to get married. That's a good thing. Amen. In fact, that's a pretty odd thing in this world today. And what are people going to think? I said, I'll tell you right now, people are going to say, thank God that love you, that care about you. They're going to say, thank God. And I'm here today to tell you, I've watched you suffer. I've watched you go through it. 
I've seen you in affliction, and I sat at the table last night. And I saw something in you and Chris's eye. I've seen it before, but it's a beautiful thing, and it's called happiness. And so you have graduated past the school of suffering. And now the Bible said that he will exalt you and he will bless you and he will strengthen you because you're, you've earned it. My wife has said repeatedly through the years, in fact, she said it again last night, Pastor Kim is the strongest woman I have ever seen. Boy, that's a powerful thing for my wife to say that. But I want to tell you, you are a strong woman. Because when you were going through the problem, in your weakness, you still kept God first. And you found out, it's not about you anyway, it's about Him. It's not about what you can do. He can do all things. And you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And so on this third anniversary, I've just come not to try to win Monroe, Louisiana. I've come to tell you, rejoice. Rejoice with her. Because the suffering, the pain, the trouble, is gone. And I trust that you gave her a great offering today because she's worthy. She's worthy. Come on, stand to your feet and give your pastor a big God bless you. That blessed me. I I don't know if it blessed y'all, but you go through things and you don't see yourself. And I tell y'all all the time, there's somebody watching you. So just keep going and you'll get through the other side. But I love y'all. I thank you for being here today and celebrating this amazing day with me. Um, I feel like redemption is still making history. And Papa, I love you. Thank you so much. I love you too, Mom Doris. Y'all are precious to me. And I could not have made it without that man right there constantly giving me that motivational, I'm not going to say it was a talk because it was stronger than a talk, (laughs) but every week I would, fall on to him and call and we'd have these long conversations and he has mentored me over the years but and when you go through a crisis where you feel like you will not survive it it's good to have somebody that still stands and says I see you daughter and you're gonna get through this and you can do this when you don't believe in yourself that right there is who you need in your life. And I just want to, I want y'all to give my pastor, my daddy, my spiritual father, mama, a big hand clap. I love y'all. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. And I love y'all. And y'all are are dismissed. And I will see y'all next Sunday. I'm starting a new series. Uh, I have not thought about what it's going to be called yet. Y'all got to show up and you'll be surprised. But it is going to be encouraging. And I'm already excited about what God has given me for you. Go to somebody right now. Encourage them. Hug their neck. And tell them something positive that maybe they need to hear today. And be reminded they will make it. If they just keep going, amen. Don't quit now, right? Amen.